A big change is coming in our lives. We're at the beginning of a revolution that will harness the world of the infinitesimally small, the nano universe. Working at the incredible scale of one millionth of a millimeter, scientists are now freely moving individual atoms and molecules. They're predicting that this science of the minuscule will open a new world of possibilities. The nanotechnology is a key for the future because it's not just one thing. It impacts every single area of life. The ultimate goal of nanotechnology is the complete control of the physical structure of matter. And it's already taking hold in major cities around the world. But most of us will never notice its arrival because this technology is invisible. Atoms that react to light are being used to coat walls and windows so they automatically clean themselves. A nanofiber that is stronger and lighter than steel is finding its way into all kinds of high-performance sports equipment. And nanoelectronics research is underway that could bring a fundamental change to the tracking of goods and people. Even a nano-sized computer that mimics the workings of the human brain may one day become a reality. With new super-efficient materials, nano promises a complete transformation in how we live our lives. So open your minds to the science of the small and the future it could make possible. We have always counted on new technologies to help us shape our world. Now, researchers are crossing another technological frontier. In the nano dimension, they're learning to manipulate the most intimate mechanics of life, and they promise us more control of our bodies and of our environment. This three-part series explores a mysterious and unknown universe and the revolution it promises. Around the world, cities are growing up and out, and nanotechnology is about to bring enormous and invisible change to the people living in them. Already, architects and engineers are working with a wave of nanomaterials synthesized in laboratories. They're the first products of research which began about 30 years ago. It's, um coming down. Professor Jim Jimjeski has spent his entire professional life in the realm of the very small. Based at UCLA, he's a world-renowned expert on the physics and chemistry of single molecules and a central figure in the invention that opened the doors to this minuscule arena. And we are interested in biologically inspired uh, types of circuits. So Dr. Jim Jeske was one of the first people to observe science at work on a nano scale. In the 1980s at IBM Zurich, he was part of the team that developed a new instrument called the Scanning Tunneling Microscope, or STM. These microscopes don't have lenses like optical scopes. What they do is scan the surface of a sample like reading Braille. Welcome to the nano world. The scale is one millionth of a millimeter. This is a world of individual atoms. The STM has an ultra-thin probe that can read a surface and convert the gathered information into an image. From that moment on, scientists could see and study the nano universe. The STM was the first time people could actually make pictures, images of uh, atoms and molecules. Suddenly people were able to understand things in a, in a different way on the basis of single atoms rather than, you know, millions and billions as they had done in the past. The use of the new technology 
would lead to another astonishing discovery. When the probe came within one nanometer of an atom, current flowed. And by harnessing the energy, scientists found they could move individual atoms. The scanning tunneling microscope enabled them also to actually touch molecules and atoms and for the first time manipulate them on surfaces and generate structures that were unimaginable for hundreds of years before. But if scientists can move atoms, they could potentially build and shape them into something new, a discovery that would profoundly change scientific thinking. STM technology was to evolve steadily and so launch nanoscience into a range of different fields. As more and more scientists began to observe the nano world, they found they could also increase the performance of existing materials. Professor Zhongling Wang of the Georgia Institute of Technology made a breakthrough while studying the widely used chemical zinc oxide. He saw that minute pressure applied to a zinc oxide crystal produced tiny amounts of electricity. Professor Wang's team then set out to find how he could use that discovery to generate power. Each wire is only 50 nanometers thick. When the wire is bent, minute levels of current were generated. So the team took several million of these nanowires and fixed them between electrodes. Then stacked them in layers, giving them even more power. The output amounted to three volts, twice the power of a double-A battery. What is available to us most time is mechanical energy, vibration, noises, line, wind flow, air flows. Those are all mechanical energy. If we can convert those into electricity, we can power devices. Professor Wong's ultimate goal is to create power from something as simple as the vibrations of our bodies. Mobile phones and portable gadgets could be charged anytime, anywhere. And there are other goals. Some engineers speculate that one day there will be lightweight passenger aircraft which glide through the air. But for now, the nano products that are commercially available are distinctly more prosaic. Take glass. In this Japanese airport, the walls are made almost entirely of glass, almost 15,000 panes. But how to keep it clean? At Central Japan International Airport, the glass has been treated with a photocatalytic coating which cleans the surface automatically. It's window cleaning the nano way. There are titanium dioxide clusters only 10 nanometers in diameter on the surface. UV light changes the oxygen in the air into high energy molecules called reactive oxygen. These molecules break down the dirt particles. Just like in a detergent ad, if you smudge dirt onto the nano glass and then compare it with equally dirty regular glass under ultraviolet light, there's an obvious difference. There is another feature that enhances self-cleaning of the nano-treated glass, rain. On regular glass, water forms into droplets, but on nano glass, water reacts with the nano material and spreads, coating the surface evenly. In this state, the water can seep in between the glass surface and dirt, 
washing it away. The photocatalysts, they're actually tiny nanoparticles, and the efficiency of them and how they work is really dependent on their shape. And so once we can understand their shape and we can modify the shape and so on and the dimensions of those particles, then we can obtain something that's very, very efficient because just a big piece of, you know, titanium dioxide doesn't perform these functions. It's essential, it's the first step and it's a continual uh, process that's used in the evolution of nanomaterials. Photocatalytic coatings are already widely used in cities across Japan. On highway sound barriers, on the walls of houses, even in hospital washrooms. Ironically, you even find nano coatings on antiviral masks, another example of the unseen spread of nanotechnology. Other scientists have succeeded in building materials that could potentially revolutionize construction and engineering. What they have in common is a radically new component, tiny building blocks, carbon nanotubes. It's a new form of carbon where atoms have been joined into hexagon structures and then rolled into a single cylindrical form. The diameter is an unbelievable one nanometer or one hundred thousandth of the width of a human hair. It could become the super material of the century. So carbon nanotubes are actually an example of the first material to be you know, engineered and created in a laboratory by man. It's not, you know, some ex you know, existing material that's modified. And that is a very unique um, capability. Carbon nanotubes, known as CNT, are 20 times stronger than steel. They were created by accident in 1991 when a Japanese scientist was working on another nano project. Later, they were found not only to be strong and lightweight, they were also semiconductors and metals. Scientists around the world, including NASA, quickly saw the potential. There were many applications for such promising lightweight material, but the challenge was how to mass produce the tubes in sufficient volume. As so often happens in nanotechnology, the jump from laboratory to production line can be problematic, especially when working at the microscopic level. I want to talk to you about at the University of Oklahoma, uh, Professor Daniel Rosasco came up with a solution. Same. To speed up the growth process, he developed a catalyst which can function in the nano dimension. Sequentially using hydrogen, nitrogen, and carbon monoxide, Dr. Rosasco then adds the catalyst, which in turn enables the carbon atoms to assemble and organize into a pattern which will form the basis of the nanotube structure. You need a very special catalyst to produce single wall nanotube. So you have a cluster, and around this cluster, a cap is formed, and then once the cap is formed, the rest of the nanotube grows by self-assembly of atoms around this uh, first cup. So the nanotubes will grow from the original catalyst. For scientists to build atom by atom would take an astronomical amount of time. This remarkable self-organization at the nano level allows for easier production of the nanomaterials. Seeing the potential of this building process, Dr. Rosasco set out to devise a system to mass produce semiconducting carbon nanotubes. With financial support from NASA, he built a bigger reactor and repeated his lab experiment, only this time on a larger scale. The output of carbon nanotubes has steadily increased. 
prompting corporations around the world to find new uses for the wonder material. Sturdy, lightweight bicycles. Tennis rackets. While an array of CNT consumer products are already on the market, researchers anticipate that the tiny building blocks might have a far more important role in the future, such as strengthening cable wires for bridges and elevators, where they'll withstand the harshest of conditions. The carbon nanotubes have an absolutely huge potential. If you start again to use your imagination and start to imagine, you know, the different forms that you can achieve on a very large scale, where you're not limited by the usual laws, you know, that govern how structures are formed. So there is no limitation except the human imagination and creativity. And that is probably in science and engineering of the future, that is the, the most important thing. Where might these leaps of the imagination take us? We've jumped into the future to dramatize how the technology might unfold. To look at space travel through the eyes of a child. Johnny's almost eight. For a long while, he wanted to fly a spaceship. Until I told him about riding into space on an elevator. That changed everything. It's all he ever thinks about these days. They haven't built a space elevator yet, of course, but it's coming soon, or so they say. Until about 50 years ago, when carbon nanotubes were discovered, the idea of a space elevator would have been dismissed as rubbish because materials were too heavy back then. There's nothing like space technology to captivate an eight-year-old. Johnny! Johnny! Miss Violet! How's your space elevator project coming? Good, Miss Violet. It will be ready for simulation soon. Really? Then I'd like to see it. Well, it's not done yet, but I'll show it to you. Rocket travel never really appealed to me. It's too dirty and too dangerous. But an elevator? Here we go. That's different. Just get in, press start, and you're away. <laughs> Maybe I'll join Johnny one day. Soon, it will be 10,000 kilometers above Earth. I still need to add 26,000 kilometers and join it with geosynchronous satellite. Then it will be done. It will be done. Most of us use computers every day. In a short period of time, the personal computer has taken over our lives. We use them at work. We use them at home. They enable our cities to function more efficiently. But how do you increase their power and function? Nanotechnologists are trying to build an ever more powerful computer, one that far exceeds anything we have today. The computer has been around for nearly 70 years. Its size has steadily shrunk, from filling up an entire room to fitting in our hands. It's also become more efficient, working billions of times faster than it did in the early days. Current technology uses silicon to build the chips, but their capacity is limited by the scale of the distance between them. Silicon wires less than 20 nanometers apart interfere with one another. They don't function as efficiently and sometimes cease to operate altogether. As things become faster and more dense, they become smaller and we start to hit some fundamental limits. And those fundamental limits will stop the current technology advancing. 
The nanoscientist's vision of the future is one that defies traditional limits in size, scale, and design. Here at the T.J. Watson Research Center in New York State, this computer manufacturer is developing a remarkable new nanomaterial that could revolutionize computer technology. It's called graphene, and it's being developed by Dr. Chun Young Sung's research group at IBM. Dr. Sung believes it will replace conventional silicon. Graphene is made out of carbon atoms that have been arranged into hexagons, forming a two-dimensional sheet. It's less than one nanometer thick. It's extremely strong and flexible and can carry high currents, approximately a thousand times more efficiently than copper. Graphene has a lot of advantage and the number one is one atomic layer, very easy to scale as it for the very small devices. And number two is a very high mobility and the devices made by graphene tends to have a very fast speed. This combination of properties means it's suited for use in a wide range of electronic devices. Dr. Sung's team has been studying graphene as a potential replacement for computer silicon switches. Most electronic devices are based on digital electronics. They require a set of switches to work together in an organized way. If the switches can be made to be more efficient and more effective, there's a similar gain in efficiency and performance. So far, Dr. Sung's test switches have performed at a faster rate than expected. The long-term goal is to come up with high-performance computing devices by using graphene as a new electronics material. In the next 20, even 30 years, and continue to improve the uh, computer performance and in the transistor scale, also in the system scale. Elsewhere, other scientists are working on ways to improve computer performance. In Japan, they are working on a concept that could further advance the technology. Dr. Masakazu Aono is one of the world's leading nanomaterial scientists. A few years ago, Dr. Aono was studying electrical circuits. Then by accident, he observed an interesting phenomenon. While trying to build a metallic nanostructure, Dr. Aono noticed that silver was attaching itself to the platinum probe. He had placed silver sulfide and platinum one nanometer apart. When he applied voltage, the silver atom started to grow. Under certain conditions, the silver atom just keeps growing. And when you change polarities of the voltage from plus to minus, the silver begins to shrink when we saw these results, I immediately thought this can be used as the first atom-sized switch that would operate at room temperature. It was a discovery that became the basis of the design of the world's smallest atom switch. The distance between the two electrodes is one nanometer. As electric current flows, individual atoms leap out, acting as a switch. So we achieve the switching motion by moving and controlling just a few atoms. The computer is an amassing of countless on-off switches like that and it calculates and memorizes through individual switches going on, off, on, off. So, basically, it makes it possible for us to make it very small. Dr. Aono found another interesting characteristic of the atom switch. As power is increased, the switch maintains its on position despite being shut off. It's similar to how personal computers are able to reboot very quickly after being shut down. 
it was a discovery that ushered in another phase in computer evolution. When UCLA's professor Jim Jimjeski heard about the atom switch, he decided to visit Japan. His idea was to use the atom switch in a neuromorphic computer, one that could potentially mimic the human brain. Hey. Hi. Hi, Jim. Spatially. The research is a collaboration between Dr. Aono's lab in Japan and Professor Jimjewski's lab in California. And their long-term goal is to build artificial neural systems. The human brain is made up of a hundred billion nerve cells called neurons. Neurons transmit electrochemical signals to each other and to the rest of the body. The signals are conveyed at intersections where two neurons come close together in a junction called a synapse. Professor Jinjeski believes that this interaction parallels what happens in the atom switch. And when I saw it, I started to think, we can use this in a different way. We can use this in a way where these elements are like what you call synapses. These are things, you know, inside the neurons that trigger information. And I started to see these devices are behaving like neurons. So how could we wire them together? And when I thought, how do we wire them together? I looked at the structure of the brain. And when you look at the neurons, you know, they're interconnected, kind of tangled messes. I thought, well, let's make the wires that way. And, and, and sort of mimic the brain. Professor Jim Jeski was convinced that he could structure the silver and sulfur atoms in a computer, creating a structure that mimicked the brain's complex system. In his research lab in Los Angeles, work was soon underway to build the brain circuit. The first step was to recreate the structure of the neurons in the brain. If Jim Jeske could achieve that, the system would theoretically function like the brain. If you watch the brain circuit assemble, you'll see that embedded in this complex pattern are billions of atom switches. Professor Jim Jeski then applied a current to the circuit and witnessed the circuit changing its configuration. Okay, the circuit links where current flowed became stronger and thicker, allowing for more current to flow. But beyond that, the artificial circuit also showed signs of a phenomenon that mimicked memory. It doesn't have any real knowledge. And then, as it experiences things, it starts to develop connections, and then it has an experience. And from this past experience, then it can predict, let's say, future experiences. And that is um, a process of, let's say, learning and developing. OK. So when we look through this data, Professor Jim Jeffsky's team was applying a constant current to the brain circuit when the current suddenly soared to an unexpected level. What was going on? What was the cause? The team began a collaboration with scientists at the university in Mallorca, Spain. Jim Jeski has been working with Argentinian brain scientist, Professor Dante Chialvo. 
Kielvo has been studying brain patterns and has been measuring the electrical currents transmitted through the brain when we experience emotions. In the human brain, when we think of something especially evocative or are overcome with emotions, there's a sudden flood of signals. Professor Kielvo was amazed at the similarities between the artificial brain circuit and the human brain. That the basic mechanism of the human brain and the basic dynamics of these atomic switch is exactly the same. And it's not just a metaphor, because the physics that, that rules this collective process is universal. Research into the brain-computer circuit is still preliminary, but Professor Jim Jeske aims one day to develop an alternate intelligence. The current goal is for this um, system to be able to learn things, and it could learn, you know, what you like. It could learn your habits. When you grew up, you would have coffee there. It could be your friend, yeah, because their experience would be your experience. So if you're with them constantly, they would become understanding of you. It's an extraordinary vision, one that seems closer to science fiction than contemporary science. Welcome to the nano city of the future. I guess I'm very much at home in the virtual world. It's just so perfect. You can just step into another universe anytime you like, and it's out there thinking about you. 98% of customers with your palate love this new dessert. I mean, you hardly have to leave the house. I even have a personal shopper. 98% of customers like you who bought that dress only wore it once. There's just no end to the ingenuity. Take Johnny. Johnny! Johnny! He's an artificial intelligence I've been raising for eight months now. Hi, Miss Violet. I'm his virtual guardian. He's programmed to grow 12 times faster than a real child. So today, he's eight. Birthdays are always a special treat. Johnny, did you remember today's your birthday? Of course I remember it, Miss Violet. With Johnny, there's no mess, no fights, no disappointments. And he's always so grateful. Make a wish and blow out the candles. Congratulations. Thank you very much, Miss Violet. Go on, enjoy your cake. Thank you very much. This is my favorite kind. But what is really extraordinary is that, so you don't get bored, the designers build in deliberate mistakes, imperfections. How is it? Good? Character it's failings, that sort good. of thing. How does it taste? Sweet, because it's cake. You don't have to say, because it's cake. I'm sorry, Miss Violet. I won't say, because it's cake anymore. What do you feel when you eat something sweet? Sweets make me feel happy because glucose is an important nutrient for brain function. I'm not asking you for a reason. I want to know how you feel. Johnny's not strong on emotion. It's very good. And how does that make you feel? Strawberry, 20 grams. In fact, he doesn't have any. Kiwi, 14 grams. Mango, 10 grams. Vitamin C content, 5.4%. I didn't ask you to analyze the ingredients. You don't need to do that. I don't, but you need them. I don't die, but you do. Health information, it's very important to you. But you know, I guess I prefer it that way. If there's no emotion, it's just that much easier to switch them off. Johnny, 
What do you feel when you eat something sweet? Sweets make me feel happy because glucose is an important... As cities expand and become more complex, so do some of the problems facing those who live and work in them. There are concerns about pollution and crime, even terrorism. Surveillance cameras gaze down on the streets, scanning, hunting for signs of anything unusual. There are other, less obvious threats, poisonous gases, radiation, and the fear of some unseen health hazard. Danger doesn't only lie in what you can see, so some are looking to technology for the answer. Demand is growing for sensors that don't just quietly observe, but that can actively monitor and detect in real time. In Korea, scientists are working on a device that will revolutionize our ability to track both merchandise and people. The Radio Frequency Identification, or RFID, is a tag containing product data combined with a radio frequency device. In theory, it could be used by consumers. But in practice, it's more likely to become an electronic label tracking everything in a store. RFIDs are relatively easy and cheap to mass produce. Professor Gyu Jin Cho uses a special ink which has some unusual properties. The ink is infused with carbon nanotubes, a material which you'll recall, in addition to being strong and durable, is also a semiconductor. This permits the duplication of all RFID tag components. Transistors and antennae don't have to be assembled in a production line. They're simply printed. The potential savings would allow for the cost to drop below one cent per sticker, a price that Professor Cho predicts will mean that RFIDs will be found on every product and will become as ubiquitous as the barcode. It's also no big jump in the imagination to suggest that when that happens, and it could be soon, theft and shoplifting rates will see a sudden and dramatic drop. The long arm of the law will also be enhanced by other sensor-driven technology that promises even more sophisticated surveillance systems. Dr. Genki Yoshikawa has developed a powerful sensor that can detect potentially dangerous substances by using a unique and down-to-earth inspiration. He wanted to make a sensor that was as sensitive as the nose of airport sniffer dogs. Every canine's nose has a mass of tiny nerve endings called receptors, each designed to bind with a specific chemical. The overall combination allows the dog to figure out the big picture and to distinguish between individual scents. Dr. Yoshikawa succeeded in recreating the mechanism artificially. He tested the sensor with meat, something the human nose has difficulty differentiating. But the sensor was able to pinpoint the subtle differences precisely. How does this perform in the nano world? The air is full of molecules that emit various odors. When the molecule touches a receptor, its surface bends. The shift in stress is only on a nanoscale, but the combination of molecules allows the sensor to determine the smell. The research is still at an early stage, with only eight sensors assembled. According to Dr. Yoshikawa, by building more sensors and pre-programming them with various molecular patterns, the system will be able to detect any dangerous substances, from drugs to dynamite.
Right now, if you wanted to check how polluted the air is, uh, how polluted the river is, or how much pollutant is in the drinking water, we couldn't do it. I mean, it would be very difficult to do on an individual level. But if we can attach this sensor to our mobile phones or clothes, each person will, will have the freedom to check what is going on in the environment around him. The artificial nose could soon become as widely used as the surveillance camera, a smaller hidden sentinel, an electronic guard dog. Nanosensors can be distributed in a city and they can monitor not only where there's a danger, but they can monitor how that danger is, for instance, moving or propagating through the, the system. And with that, then people can take action immediately. A society where unseen multifunctional sensors monitor our every move may seem comforting to some, but others are not so sure. Does the constant intrusion in our lives outweigh the advantages? When does surveillance become Snoopy? One is the ability to monitor people's behavior in a more and more obtrusive manner. So you can collect data about their genetics. You can, you can observe them wherever they are with you know, nano RFID tags. And how that information will be used by corporations and governments or even you know, terrorist groups, that is a major concern of people. Higher levels of surveillance, both unseen and interactive, could dramatically alter day-to-day -day life in our biggest cities. So what might life theoretically be like 30 years in the future? The strangest thing happened to me this morning. I was walking home when I saw one of my neighbor's kids' toys out on the street. I picked it up and took it to their place. But as I did, I noticed the sensor must have been tracking me. But how? Sometimes all this sensory data can be a little unnerving. I mean, I enjoy the sheer convenience of it. I can work from home most of the time and shop. And lately, I can even get an instant medical checkup. It's all thanks to this new initiative from the National Health Directorate. We all have nano capsules embedded in our bodies. All you have to do is lie back, and the data is transmitted to the directorate. They'll analyze it, and if it's anything serious, they tell you what has to be done and when. Simple stuff like prescriptions is sent to you in seconds. Please renew your social data card. You have 10 days to comply. This is a mandatory renewal to provide the latest technological benefits to each and every one of you. Thank you for your cooperation. But then there's the social data card. It has all your personal data and is your official ID. You can't go anywhere without it. ID regulations just get tighter and tighter. At first, ID segregation was only for people with criminal records. But once the idea caught on, the urge to classify just went wild. It used to be a bit of a game, like getting into clubs. But these days, it's different. You do not have an account with us. Please do not enter our building unless it is necessary. Everything is codified. You're either in or you're out. It's okay, I guess, if you're one of the elite. 
But if not? This restaurant is for members only. We do not have a table for you. Sometimes I wonder whether I know enough that they know something I don't, particularly about those capsules and what they're really doing. Your security clearance will be lowered. Be aware of the consequences. You look fantastic in this. Violet Humphrey, did you enjoy your last purchase with us? Miss Humphrey, our fall winter collections are 25% off. Especially for you, Miss Humphrey. Do not miss this great opportunity. They say it's just health stuff, but my fear is there's something else going on. Someone out there wants to know everything about me. That's why this morning was so odd. I'd forgotten my ID card at home, but my neighbor's security system still knew who I was. Could it be that they know everything about me? What I like and what I think? What I feel? That they have an imprint of everything that's happened to me since the day I was born? There's no escape? Walk slower. Your heart rate is increasing. Walk slower. Your heart rate is increasing. The future, suggested by the dark side of nanotechnology, may never materialize. But how does society protect itself from such a malign occurrence. What path should we take? Governments around the world are both intrigued and unnerved by the potential impact of this new science, an attitude shared by Britain's Royal Society, which published a report with the Royal Academy of Engineering that expressed both confidence and caution. The Society's past president is the master of Trinity College, Cambridge, world-renowned cosmologist and astrophysicist, Sir Martin Rees. As nanotechnology moves from the lab to big business, how do you keep control? Well, several years ago, the Royal Society initiated a study of nanotechnology. Uh, we thought it was very important that the scientists should consider whether there were any risks and that they should do this at an early stage before the commercial interest became engaged. Professor Rees thinks that it's up to the nanotechnology scientists themselves to recognize the dark side of the new technology and to make sure it doesn't have any unexpected consequences. I think one should not worry about any catastrophes from nanotechnology, but there are obviously risks from any new technology, just as there are opportunities. And the aim of scientists and of their governments uh, should be to ensure that we can harness the great benefits which this technology will apply and avoid uh, the risks. If nanotechnology does take hold of the imagination of the public and of investors, it will become increasingly difficult if not impossible to direct. It promises to revolutionize medicine. It could even play a key role in saving the environment. But will it? The nanotechnology is a key for the future because it's not just one thing, you know, like electronics. It impacts every single area of life, whether it be environment, energy, medicine, communications. I believe that, you know, scientists have a moral responsibility to explain what they do in the laboratory to, to everyone and to engage in a debate between you know society on every level scientific and non-scientific about 
this technology since it will change them. And I, have, I, I take pleasure in that. That is my duty as a scientist. Unlike previous revolutions, Nano is distinguished by its apparent absence, an unseen world that is small in scale, but potentially big in impact, a wondrous new world.